Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Serum School Prep Academy. I am your host, Jenny Fennell, and I'm excited to share some pediatric anesthesia with you today. So I want to start off by saying that all of this is just purely educational and to use your own due diligence to look up these facts. So essentially, I'm saying to fact check me. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy to share with you what I know. Um, I am going to be looking at my notes uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube. And for those of you who actually can see me, I am wearing 4th of July stuff because this will be airing probably right around 4th of July. So happy 4th of July for those who are listening around that time. Um, but yeah, so a little bit of background too. Um, I wouldn't say my area of expertise is actually pediatric anesthesia because I've spent the vast majority of my seven year career doing adult open heart anesthesia. Um, however, in my five year stint that I did adult open hearts, I did actually do intermittent pediatric cases, maybe like once or twice a month. And so while yes, I did some pediatric cases, I wouldn't say I was the, the go-to person where I used to work to do pediatric cases. Um, I then spent about a year, year and a half doing outpatient um, regional um, at an orthopedic center. So that was about a year, year and a half of my career. And then just recently, within the last eight to nine months, I've been working at an all pediatric hospital. So I do peds every single day. Um, I really like it. Um, I wasn't sure, to be quite honest, how I would like it. So I was nervous to go there to work at an all pediatric hospital. Um, I will say, though, that Typically teenagers, once they get to be about, you know, sometimes they're even as young as 10 or 12, they are kind of like adult size and kind of act like adults. Um, and we also do adult burns. So there is still a nice variety where I work. I did get, I can do a neonate, um, which is less than 30 days old, um, or a preemie even. And then I, the next case I could be doing would be a 17 year old who's, you know, completely an adult size and reacts like an adult. So there is still a nice mixture. Um, so if that's you, I'm speaking to that you're afraid to kind of go into peds, know that you're going to get a good mixture of um, patient population. So it's, um, and it's actually, I, I, it's actually more challenging to work than working with just adults, because again, the sizes change so much during the day that, and the physiology behind that, it's actually, it's very challenging. Um, one of the more challenging, I think it's almost more challenging to doing hearts. Now, granted, I am still new at it, I would say, because again, I've only been doing it for eight or nine months. Um, but just getting in the swing of things is, is very challenging. I actually felt like a student all over again uh, when I started this uh, career path. So for those of you getting ready to start your pediatric rotations, <laughs> I feel you, I feel your pain. It's like, holy cow, remembering all the weight-based dosing again. Um, you know, with adults, we get pretty comfortable knowing standard doses. Um, it's just so different in pediatrics where everything you do is calculated to the T. So you have to be very, very precise and there's very, very little margin of error in ped. So that's another thing you have to be very, very, not that you're not vigilant with adults, but it's just, you know, if you have a little baby, that's only one kilo, you have to be very, very exact with what you do, everything, ventilation, fluids, drugs, all of that, um, versus, you know, a 70 kilo adult, you know, you can get, you have more leeway with ventilation, you have more leeway with fluid resuscitation. <laughs> so it's just, it's more pressure, I would say to work with pediatrics, especially the really little ones. Um, but again, I love it. I'm embracing the challenge. Um, I guess I encourage you all to do it throughout your career path. Um, you know, if anyone ever says this career path is boring, in my opinion, it's because they have not challenged themselves in this career path because it is not boring. You have always have opportunities to learn and grow as an anesthesia provider. And so that's why I encourage you to strive to do as um, you embark on your journey. So let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Um, so yeah, so one of the things, if you're just now starting your pediatric rotation, and I guess I should start off by saying too, if you're still pretty new, like in your nursing career and you're listening to this episode, you know, I, I encourage you to listen to it because there's definitely going to be some takeaways. You're going to learn something. Um, but if you get overwhelmed, know that that's okay. And to be expected, because again, this is a very, um, unique patient population and it's very, there's a lot of detail that goes into it and a lot of differences to know, um, kids are not just little adults. <laughs> kids are your, their own unique little beings, you know, and, um, they're awesome too. They're fun. Um, and then most of you guys know, I just, we just had our third baby almost two months ago. Um, I'm still drinking from the hospital, um, water jug <laughs> cause it's awesome and it's huge. <laughs> so yeah. So again, I love kids and, um, but yes, little babies are definitely unique in their physiology process, their lungs, the fluid, um, everything. And I'll kind of go into all that. 
So when you're starting your rotation, one of the kind of the differences to get it used to is the dosing of the, not that you shouldn't know the dosing of the drugs as an adult, but really getting honing in on the um, weight per kilo of dosing of drugs. Um, and then just the different equipment, you know, the different airway sizes and knowing how to accurately decide what airway to put in. Um, everything's different. OG tubes, airways, oral airways, IVs. Um, some, you know, if you're under a year old, you're going to get a beer trawl for your fluids. So you can really keep a close eye on them. You never, ever want to just start an IV in a kid and leave the fluids wide open. Um, and that's also why you choose different fluid bag sizes, whether you pick a liter bag or a 500 ml bag, um, it'll kind of be that extra safety precaution. So you don't, you know, run a whole liter in a two-year-old kind of situation. Um, so anyhow, so equipment is very different. So I encourage you to get to your sites early, um, get to know where the equipment is kept. Um, another thing too, that I think in adults, and I'm guilty of this sometimes you, especially if it's a short case and don't get me wrong, I don't heat every case up, you know, if it's, if it's short. Um, but sometimes in adults, you get pretty comfortable with the fact that you don't worry too much about them being super cold. Um, especially little babies, they, um, they can get cold quickly. Um, you can also cook them quickly. <laughs> so, um, that being said, you want to make sure you're really monitoring your kid's temperature. Um, and always the best way to do that is trying to get a core temp, whether that be in the nose or down the esophagus, um, skin temp is just really not that accurate. Um, so take it for what it's worth. If you have a skin temp probe on, you have a bear hugger blowing on right where the skin temp probe is, you're going to read much higher. So try to be aware of where you're putting the temp probe. If I am doing skin, I really try really hard to put it inside the armpit. Um, so it's not just on the skin. Um, sometimes it's not possible if they like are really rushing you. And before you know it, the, <laughs> the surgeon has the drapes over the patient and you would bump the surgeon if you were trying to put the temp probe on, you know, so just use your best judgment or where you can put it. Sometimes you can't put it in the nose because they're operating around the face and they would knock it out of the way. It'd be in the sterile field, you know? So, and again, same thing with the mouth, you can't always get where you want it. Um, so that's when I usually try to go to the armpit with my temp probe, but just getting familiar with all the equipment sizes, um, making sure you're studying up the formulas prior to starting your clinical rotation. Um, so I'm going to look, refer to my notes here just so I can kind of stay on track with some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, so again, you know, also studying up on just the physiology ventilation wise with kids and knowing how to ventilate a kid appropriately and the different physiology process of why is important as well. Um, so kind of going into some definitions here, if you guys, a newborn is from, you know, uh, the first 24 hours, that's a newborn. Um, I wouldn't say we routinely operate on newborns. Um, that's pretty rare. It'd have to be a pretty life-threatening, um, situation to operate on a newborn. Um, you know, neonates definitely routinely, we do operate on neonates, which is less than 30 days old. Um, and then you have your infants, which is one to 12 months. Um, and then you have your toddlers one to three years, and then you have your children one to 12 years. And typically when kids get to be around 13 years old, again, they become a little bit more like adults. Don't get me wrong. They're still kids. Um, and there's still some unique things about them, but for the most part, their physiology process and, you know, can be more like an adult, but a 13 year old can vary. You guys, I've seen a 13 year old that weighs like 40 kilos. I mean, and then I've seen a 13 year old that's, you know, 120 kilos. <laughs> so the size can vary so greatly when we get to those teenage years, as you know, some kids are late bloomers, some bloom early. So it, you never know what you're going to get as far as size goes in teenagers. You can see your schedule for the day. And, you know, the best thing to do is try to look them up and see their height and weight, um, knowing that their weight doesn't always mean that they're going to be tall, you know, so you have to, again, adjust, uh, appropriately. Um, and also vital signs. So with all these different ages come different vital signs. That's also why peds is more challenging than adults is because not that adults don't have different vital signs. If you have chronic hypertension and things like that, but knowing what the normal is for kids of different ages is something that you have to be aware of that it can, it's going to be different. You know, a newborn is going to have a very different expected vital set than a 13 year old. So, um, I'll go, kind of go over some, um, and then we're going to skip newborn just because again, we rarely ever do newborns. Um, but neonates, again, a standard blood pressure for a neonate, which is less than 30 days is 80 over 46, 
with a heart rate of 100 to 185. That's a very big range. Obviously, 185 is very high. Um, but if they're really excited and like you typically would maybe see that during an induction, for example. Um, but you know, if they were at rest in a case, I would say, you know, one one twenties. That's probably more like a, a neonate uh, 130s, that kind of thing. Um, and keep in mind, too, with all vital signs and anesthesia, you really want to keep them, you know, I shoot for 15% of their baseline, 20% being on, I don't really want to see much much over 20% below their baseline. Um, and that's same to be said with adults, actually. So I kind of try to stick to that. If they're less than, um, or if they're under 20% or over 20% of their baseline, I don't know, I'm confusing myself under over. Um, but if their blood pressure is less than 20% of their ba baseline, um, that's when you got to think, okay, what's, what am I doing that's causing this? Or do they need some kind of intervention or is it, or do they have too much gas on board? Are they too deep for the stimulation that's going on during the case? Um, is it maybe because you just dose some fentanyl or, um, do, are they dry, you know, or, you know, so always try to evaluate what you can do or do they need a vasopressor? So, um, one thing I will say, I'm, you know, and this goes back to my original training when I was in school that I could say that I'm still trying to kind of combat a little bit is, you know, with kids and using vasopressors, I guess, initially in my training, it was, you know, you rarely ever use them only if you absolutely have to. And don't get me wrong. That's always kind of the case. You always want to assess. You don't just want to jump straight to vasopressors anyways. You really want to assess the whole situation. Um, because if they need fluid, you're not going to help them by squeezing them. You really need to give them fluid. Um, but I guess I, you know, in my mind, I was always thought that was like that sh kids shouldn't need vasopressors, you know, but that's just not true. Um, so now again, I'm telling you that I'm learning and I'm embracing the being uncomfortable and learning process, um, that you shouldn't be afraid. You should not ever let a kid just ride a whole case with low blood pressure, assuming they're going to be okay. Because again, there has been some studies on kids who, you know, there's a lot of literature out there that says, you know, is it, is it, um, harmful to have a kid under anesthesia, especially if they're coming back for repeated procedures. Is it harmful to experience anesthesia young in life? Does it hinder your um, um, development later on as far as um, intelligence and things like that? You know, there's not a whole lot of, there's back and forth on that. Um, but there has been, especially kids who have repeated anesthesia, um, there has been some correlation with that. So a lot of that you guys could be potentially due to lower blood pressure. Same with an adult. Um, the thing is, you know, sometimes kids will have these frequent anesthesia, like if they have tracheal stenosis or something like that, you know, most adults, you know, not that you do get frequent flyers, but I would say if you have a kid with an issue, they're more likely to come back frequently as a child where an adult, you know, doesn't necessarily have that experience as a child where their brain is developing, um, you know, at the pace that they are in peds, um, you know, adults brains, they kind of deteriorate after age 30 and Hey, I'm 35. So I'm in that bulk. <laughs> um, but it is true that after age 30, your brain, you actually <laughs> produce, um, is it less white matter? That's a whole nother lecture for another day. Um, so we're declining, <laughs> um, but kids are just growing. They're growing quickly and fast They're building those neurons and those connections. And so there's been something, you know, literature saying, you know, being put under anesthesia is that hindering that development. Um, but a lot of it could play into low blood pressure. So never neglect low blood pressure, even in peds. And if you're a student in peds and you're questioning what to do, don't be afraid to ask, you know, if your preceptor leaves you alone in the room for a little bit and your pressure is low, ask, get them to the bedside and ask them. Don't be afraid to just let it ride. Um, you know, if you're not sure, make sure you're asking whether this is acceptable or not. Um, but again, I, I try to shoot for that 20%, uh, 15 to 20%. Okay. That was a little tangent. So let's go on to the next one. So infants one to 12 months, um, lower blood pressure is about 90 to over 66. Um, so at 20%, that'd be 72 over 53. Um, so again, if they pop up a blood pressure of 50 over, you know, 40 or 50 over 32, um, you need to make sure you're doing something about that. Um, most of the time, I would say most of the time, even with adults, it's because your anesthesia is too much. Um, and you can make some adjustments with that. Um, the caveat to that is usually you get those low blood pressures after induction and there's no stimulation. And so you're waiting for the surgery to start. You don't want to lighten them up so much that when they actually do start the procedure, they're going to fly off the table and self extubate. So you want to make sure that yes, you can lighten them up because there's no stimulation, but make sure you're paying attention to when the case is getting ready to start. So you can deepen them back up, make sure there's enough narcotic on board, reparalyze them, um, those types of things. 
Um, and you know, sometimes if I'm really desperate, again, keep in mind, um, you can move and not have recall just because you move does not mean you're awake. Um, that's really unfortunate that some, even a lot of surgeons don't understand that those are the patients awake and you're like, they're not awake. They have plenty of gas on, but they're going to move. You stabbed them with a knife and their body's like, ow, that hurts. <laughs> um, heck, I mean, I hope my body reacts to that even if I'm asleep. <laughs> uh, so it just goes to show that you don't have recall, but you can still have that, that, your, your body still can sense like, Oh, ouch, this is painful. I should pull away. Um, in order to actually, um, take away that reflux with just gas, you'd have to have over a Mac and a, or two and a half Mac of gas on. That's a lot. You guys, that would be enough to like make anyone's blood pressure low. So again, um, don't be afraid if you just need to paralyze a patient, but you want to run them light, lighter on gas, so their blood pressure is okay. Just paralyze them. And you know, don't, don't, it's really just, make, keep the patient safe. Um, you don't want to have them so deep so they don't move, but not use paralytic and then have them ride with low blood pressure, just paralyze them. Um, there's always Sugamidex these days to reverse, um, rocaronium. And if you're really giving it a weight-based dose of rocaronium, like a 0.6 dose or even less than that per kilo, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be able to reverse them. Um, just be aware of how to dose the medications and you'll be okay. Um, all right. And so in children, a blood pressure of 110 over 60, um, is, you know, a normal blood pressure. So again, figure out the 20% of that. And that's kind of where you would want to question what you're doing and if it needs to be treated. Another thing to point out in kids, um, especially for infants, one to 12 years is that a slower heart rate is a bad thing. Um, kids are dependent on their heart rate um, they have kind of a fixed stroke volume. So that's why they really need a faster heart rate to kind of compensate for that. Um, which is something unique about kids. So from one to 12 months, um, any, a heart rate, um, less than 80 is something to be concerned about. Now it's very common when you induce anesthesia in kids to not only see junctional rhythms, um, but bradycardia. And that's always like, and that's so like, especially as, there's a lot of times like we'll do induce and I'll be almost 90 degrees away from my vent. Um, I always make sure I can see my screen here. And I, that's why it's important to have the radio off during induction. All focus needs to be on the patient. You can't have loud music blaring in the background. If that's the case, make sure you're speaking up and saying, Hey, that needs to go off. We need to put full attention on the patient right now. And I need to be able to hear because when you hear that heart rate slow down, you immediately know that's when you got to turn your gas back. And that's during induction. Um, cause typically with kids you'll induce with, you'll just, you know, max out your sevoflurane, um, which you need to get them through that stage two quickly. Um, cause the stage two is the more dangerous part of anesthesia, but then you also deal with the, now you're too deep. Um, and again, you can get the bradycardia and, um, even junctional rhythms and things like that. Um, you know, so just be aware of that. Listen for it. When that happens, just turn your gas back. Um, that's all you have to do. And it's, it's usually, it's fine. So don't freak out, but also know that you have to be listening and aware that that's going to be, um, something you're going to experience frequently in kids during induction. All right. So, um, let's go into a little bit of the airways. So kids airways are very unique. Um, I will say, and again, this is from very little experience in the big scheme of things compared to my adult experience, but just from my own comparison, what I'm going to share with you is I find pediatric airways to be easier than adults, but there's a catch 22 to that because, um, they can also be harder. So <laughs> the vast majority in my experience have been easier, but when they are hard, they are very hard. And so that's kind of where it's like adults, you'll get more difficulty, but it's still like, you can, you can, it's still doable. You know what I mean? It might not be super easy, but it's still doable where a kid most time is actually pretty easy. But then when it's hard, it's like really hard, like see nothing hard, um, no matter what you do. Uh, so, and those are, that's typically, you know, some kids have issues that make that their reality, meaning maybe they have, um, you know, just a very anterior airway due to some kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some kind of anomaly in their development. Um, so again, it could be some kind of developmental thing that just makes their anatomy as such that they have a more interior airway. Um, some kids you'll really see don't have any chin at all. Um, they have a recessed chin even, um, and then just babies, like I would say neonates, um, less than 30 days old tend to be the harder ones. And sometimes they're not, but in my own experience, they're very in, in, 
and actually not even my own experience, but just in general in the literature, their airways are more interior, they're more flat. And so when you're looking in with, and that's why always why Miller is the better blade and peds because Miller is a better blade for interior airways. I've used both. So for those of you who are like, Hey, no max, the best blade, you know what, let's just all agree to disagree that there's people have their preferences and there's really no thing that such thing as the best because it really depends on the, the, the user, right? I mean, one blade is going to be better for one user because that's what they're comfortable with. That's what they're good at. And now I'm going to go off on this tangent about blades, <laughs> but I have to just make this clear because I've experienced both. Uh, when I was a student, I was told that after you got a hundred intubations with a Mac to switch to a Miller and get comfortable with a Miller. And so whoever gave me that advice, I wish I remember who that was to give him a shout out, but I don't remember. Um, but I took that advice and that's what I did. And so by the time I was done with school and I actually finished my pediatric rotation, I spent my last three months of anesthesia school doing peds at an all peds hospital. So it was a very good experience. I only use Miller's. I got very comfortable with Miller. I actually started liking the Miller more than the Mac because I was having more success in seeing these, what would have been a grade four view with a Mac was now a grade three view with a Miller. And that is still true. Um, but then I went to work and um, where I worked, the culture there was different and I did open heart. And typically the way we did those cases, I would start the A line and big bore IV that attending would intimate um, do the central line. And so that way within like five minutes, it was like intubation, central line, IV, and we were all just working together. So the induction was super quick. Um, so that's just how we did it. And they, for whatever reason, the attendings there hated Miller's. No one used Miller's at this hospital besides a few CRNAs. And, um, so I just got used to laying out a Mac because the attending would be the one doing the airway. And that's what they all seem to prefer who did open heart. And so then I just started using a Mac. So I got very comfortable using a Mac, um, grade four view, no problem. Obviously, if you just use some laryngeal maneuver, you can typically tell where the airway should go or should be. Um, and so you just hockey stick your tube and you get it in. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, but then I went to work at a pediatric hospital. They would look at me cross-eyed, like you use a Mac, no one uses Macs here. And so I'm like, okay, now we're back to the pediatric population where everyone uses Miller's. And, um, you know, now I'm more comfortable using Miller's again. And believe it or not, you guys, even though I had gotten decent at using Miller's as a senior nursing, senior, uh, SRNA, um, I had to relearn, <laughs> I had to relearn because I hadn't used it in like four years consistently. Um, so that just goes to show that, you know, it's one of those skills where it came back quicker. It did come back quicker, but I felt rusty. I felt rusty again after not using it for four or five years. So, but it is a muscle memory thing. And so I did pick it up much quicker. I do remember as a student struggling with it a lot longer and feeling frustrated um, that I was having not having that much luck with a Miller at first. Um, within like a week or two, I was fine <laughs> as a CRNA, but as a student, I think the whole first month or more of using a Miller, I struggled. Um, if not probably long, it probably took me several months to learn how to use a Miller as a student. Anyhow, that's separate, but yeah, the airways are different. You guys, so these little tiny babies, um, not only are they more anterior, but another piece of advice too: be so gentle because they're delicate little flowers. You want to be careful with them, right? I mean, that was my little baby getting surgery and someone mucks up their airway and cuts them. I would be furious. So treat this, treat them like they're yours. And not that you wouldn't treat anyone like that, but like, just be gentle. And especially if you're coming straight from your adult population into peds, you have to be really gentle with kids. And, and the, what trick I have for you to be gentle with the airway and to not cut someone's airway with a Miller blade, cause you can, cause it's metal you guys. And, and the end of the, that it's kind of like a knife, <laughs> not really, but it's blunt anyhow. And they're just, they're just, they're delicate and you can do a lot of damage. So use three fingers. And that's, that's what I do is I, I have my thumb obviously. And then my, um, pointer finger and my middle finger. And I, that's all I use to hold my DL blade when I intubate a little tiny neonate. And, you know, maybe if it's an older kid, I'll use four fingers. I'll leave my little pinky. Like you're drinking a cup of tea <laughs> to intubate like, Ooh, um, but you know, a little tiny baby, just use three fingers and that will prevent you from being too rough. And the next tip I have for you with the little kids, especially, you know, some of these kids, you just, they may have like, and even adults too, you never know, they could have some kind of cervical instability, but never want to crank their necks back. Never. The best thing to do, if you really want to get a good sniffing position in a baby is just get a head roll, just get a little roll, um, roll it up. So their head just lays there because otherwise kids heads will like fall to the left, fall to the right, fall to the left. <laughs> 
like their heads are just little bowling, like oval shaped bowling balls. They just don't want to stay center. Um, so a way to get around that is to just put a little tiny neck roll and there you go. And if you really are struggling, then get a little foam pillow or, um, the donut pillow that will hold their head straight. Um, I've even used two separate towel rolls on either side of their ears to keep their head straight. Um, but usually during intubation, the best thing again, is just the neck roll to help you get that good sniffing position. You, you can take the head with your, with your hand and don't get me wrong. You can rock it back a little bit, but just be really gentle and really careful with it. And it's not necessary. And the younger kids, like in the neonates for sure. Um, it's obviously in teenagers and things like that, you still do that. Um, to a certain extent, but the little baby's just not necessary to like rock their head back. Um, you just don't. And also another thing too, is all you have to do, you know, you don't really scissor their mouths. And actually I want to say this too, because it's a habit that I'm trying to get out of. I was so accustomed to doing in adults is scissoring and it has bit me in the butt a few times. And that's because people's teeth are gross. Ew. Like, I mean like rotting, nasty, gross. And so like when you scissor a rotten tooth, they're going to just going to fall out. And, um, ugh, like, I mean, it's, and it's happened to me. And then you have to worry, is that going to fall out and then fall back in their airway? And so that could be a, a big issue. Um, and never, you never want to try fishing out a tooth from someone's back of their you know, throat and esophagus. So be very, very careful when you scissor, make sure you're doing a good assessment on someone's teeth prior to doing it. Um, and I will tell you right now, now that I've kind of cross the other side of not doing scissoring. You don't even need to, like, you really don't need to, but don't get me wrong. If you're really struggling, if the jaw's really tight, there are some people, some adults who have really bad TMJ. Um, you know, I'm not saying not to ever do it, but just be careful. If you do it, make sure you're assessing the teeth. And with kids, you're always losing teeth and right around that, uh, five to six year, probably more like six year mark, six to seven, eight, they're losing teeth. <laughs> so even if, you know, they come back and say they have no loose teeth, you just, you don't, you know, what if they do have a loose tooth and you knock it out? So, um, just be very, very aware of that. Um, but if you just pull down on the, on the, a baby's jaw, like I know people watching YouTube can see me, but if you just literally pull down their chin, their mouth will pop open and their little tongue will go, uh, <laughs> it'll just pop right out of your way. Um, now adults don't do that. Adults tongues are usually stuck to the roof of their mouth and ooh, can be a little more gross, but little tiny babies, like their mouth just pops right out of your way. There's no need to do anything else. Um, and so when you go in with your Miller blade, again, you're just really gentle with the three fingers, remember? And you just, the other thing, um, they're, uh, you go into their vollecula and their um, epiglottis and everything there. It's just a little more, I should say kind of oval. Is that right? Maybe like oval shaped or just, it's a little bit broader and stiffer. Um, like some adults can have like really floppy epiglottis and it just kind of falls back into the airway. Um, little tiny neonates typically don't, they're pretty rigid and stiff. Um, but they can still kind of hang. Sometimes they're even hard to see. You're like, where, I don't even know if I saw it. And so nine times out of 10, when you can't see your airway, what you've done is you've gone too deep. Um, and you're looking into the esophagus, <laughs> Um, but sometimes it's hard to see because you don't see the uvula kind of hanging your way like you would with an adult. Um, so again, it's kind of just, you have to go into the vollecula very slow until where you get where you want to be. And sometimes you won't even see, um, it's just kind of hard to tell, differentiate what's there because it's just so little. Um, and so again, nine times out of 10, what you do wrong is you go too deep with your blade. If you can't see the airway, um, so the narrowest part of the adult airway is at the glottis um, impedes. It's a sub vocal cord level. So slightly above the glottis. Um, so that's maybe a little bit different, you know, with kids with uh, tracheal stenosis, you may be able to see a good view of the, of the airway, see the cords and um, get the tube through, but then you might not be able to advance it. And so my tip to you there is, just don't force it because you're going to cause more trauma. Um, and kids can very easily develop croup, which is just pretty much airway swelling. Um, and if that happens, if you have a difficult time with the airway, make sure you're giving steroids to kind of help with that. Um, but just go with it, have multiple size tubes. And I should have said that in the beginning when you're getting your, um, airways and su supplies adults, you always want to have two different size tubes as well, but 
even more so with kids. Sometimes I even have three sizes, um, especially if you have a kid with tracheal stenosis or something like in a history, I'll have five size tubes. I mean, I'll have uncuffed, cuffed, you know, a three, a three and a half, a four, a four and a half. I'll just have them all not open, but I mean, I'll have them there because sometimes you just don't know what you're getting into. If it's been years since they've had surgery and they've grown, but you don't know how much the stenosis is still there. You really don't know what you're getting into. So you just have multiple size out just in case. Um, but yeah, always at least have two different sizes, have one that you think it's going to be in a size smaller. That's typically what I do. Um, all right. So what else about the airway? I think that's the vast majority of what I want to go into. Um, make sure I don't miss anything I want to mention here. Uh, so yeah. And then again, the shoulder roll will really help you guys out. Um, all right. So let's talk about a little bit about estimating size for kids. Um, the estimate or the formula to estimate weight, uh, weight based, like how much they should weigh if they're, you know, three years old or however old they are, um, is age times two plus nine. Okay. So let's just say you have, you know, a two-year-old, you know, that would be 13 kilos. So that'd be four plus nine. So 13 kilos. Okay. And it's pretty accurate. Um, and then also don't forget to, to convert that to pounds, you know, and just to challenge you guys, what's the conversion from kilos to pounds? Does anyone know? It's 2.2. So if you have 13 kilos, you times it by 2.2 and that'll give you the pounds. Um, it's relatively accurate. Um, don't get me wrong. Everyone. So, you know, some kids are going to be bigger. Some kids are going to be smaller, but if you really want a rough estimate, if you don't have the chart in front of you or have the actual weight listed yet, and you want to start getting some drugs ready, um, you can go ahead and kind of do this estimate in your head to kind of get a, a general idea of how big they should be, but just know that it could change. Um, you know, some kids are smaller, some kids are bigger. So you may have to adjust your drug dosing after you really find out their weight. And I encourage you to really know their weight, um, to not just guess <laughs> never, especially when it comes to drugs like neostigmine, um, you know, uh, the paralytics and stuff like that. Um, you really want to, in the narcotics, you really want to make sure you're giving a true weight-based, uh, dose. Um, again, adults, a lot more forgiving kids, not so much. Um, okay. So that's the weight-based formula. Again, that's age times two plus nine. Um, and I'm trying to think where I put it in here. Okay. So let's kind of go into a little bit of the lung mechanics of a kid. Um, so one thing about kids, um, you know, is their, believe it or not, their FRC, which is the functional, re, functional residual capacity. Bleh. <laughs> That's kind of a tongue twister trying to say that one fast. Um, but the functional residual capacity is how much volume you have left in your lungs after you take an exhale. Okay. Um, and so believe it or not, they're actually the same as adults, which is about 30 ml per kilo, maybe slightly decreased, but for the most part, they're right about there. Another thing that's actually very similar is the tidal volume per kilo, which is about seven mLs per kilo. Now I will say in anesthesia, we do 10 mLs per kilo because we want to overcome that dead space in the vent and the ventilator tubing and things. Um, so we do 10 mLs per kilo approximately when we choose our tidal volumes. But again, a seven ml per kilo is right, you know, seven to 10 mLs is really where you want to be for the tidal volume. Now this is ideal weight, I will say. <laughs> so, you know, and believe it or not, the more obese you are, the less, uh, lung volumes you can handle. Okay. Because all the adipose tissue actually causes kind of a restrictive lung disease. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, if you have someone who's, you know, 150 kilos, do not give 10 mLs per kilo tidal volumes. Like you will like give them barotrauma. So be very aware that this is ideal weight, uh, based. Okay. Um, and then also in kids, the dead space is the same as adult, which is about 2.2 mLs per kilo of dead space is just the, the natural, the normal physiological dead space. Um, however, what's unique about peds is the alveolar ventilation, meaning the actual true ventilation is two to three times more than an adult. And the reason for that is because peds have a higher metabolic demand. Um, and you know, I also, you know, think about it. They have faster heart rates. And we know in adults, one of the most, um, what's the most indicative uh, measurement of O2 demand, that's your heart rate, right? I mean, nothing stresses someone's body out more than having tachycardia, especially if you're already compromised, if you already have coronary, unstable coronary disease. 
someone who gets tachycardia is more likely to have ischemia. Um, and it's because it increases your oxygen demand and peds and kids, they're tachycardic. I mean, not really tach tachy for them, but their heart rate's always fast. You know, if they're a little tiny neonate, um, so they have, they need higher metabolic demand, more alveolar ventilation. So in order to compensate for that, they actually have a faster, um, ventilation rate two to three times more. Um, and so again, the respiratory rate is two to three times more than an adult because their O2 consumption is two to three times more than an adult. Um, and also keep in mind too, another thing that's unique about kids, because they do have such a high metabolic demand is that when they get hypoxic, they can actually get bradycardic. Um, and so this is also, and it's also because they're not super neurologically mature yet. Um, there's a lot of different um, mechanisms that are still developing in kids. Um, but that being said, being hypoxic in kids greatly affects the heart. Okay. It causes bradycardia. Um, so you want to make sure if you ever have a kid that just great, you know, always want to assess if they're hypoxic, if you get a kid that's bradycardic, um, cause especially you'll see it when you, when you go for induction, if you're not mask ventilating very well, um, especially if it goes on for a period of time, um, it, you can get bradycardia. And so that's, that's a very scary situation to be in because obviously if it goes on for that long, it means you're not, you, there's a reason why you're not ventilating well, and you're trying to obviously troubleshoot it. Um, but you know, make sure with kids always, and I should have started this off from the very beginning to always have your emergency drugs, um, have your socks and your atropine ready to go. Um, you know, I, I used to always think, especially as a student, I used to actually get them ready per the weight of the child. Now, if you have, you know, 10 cases that day, that's going to be a lot of different syringes of socks and atropine. Um, but if you, even if you don't do that, make sure you're writing down the emergency doses as a student, because especially when you're in a critical situation, it's really hard to do that head math when you're already, you know, kind of in a stressed mode. So always mentally or write it down on paper and know your, your code dose, what you would give for atropine. Um, what, what would you give for epi? What would you give, you know, if you had to give socks, know those doses of medications per weight of the actual patient. So every case you're going to have to redo these calculations. So especially as a student, I would get the assignment the night before, and I would figure all this out the night before, or I would make sure if I didn't have that information, I would get to clinical early and I would actually write all this down on a piece of paper. So every case I was prepared for what my weight-based dosing drugs would be if something were to happen. Um, so that's just a tip too, to kind of help you guys. All right. So let's go into the cardiac system a little bit here. Um, so again, I kind of mentioned before how kids kind of have a fixed stroke volume. Um, so really the only mechanism of increasing their output is increasing their heart rate. Um, and they also just have increased vagal tone again, from the immature sympathetic nervous system. And that's again, why they're prone to bradycardia. Um, so the vagal response can be more pronounced in kids. Although I swear some adults, especially it always seems to be like adult men, like have a huge vagal response. And maybe that's just me, but it just seems to be men. <laughs> I don't get me wrong. I've seen women have it too, but I don't know. That could just be my biased opinion. Um, cardiac output, um, in kids is increased by 30 to 60, 30 to 60%, um, especially in neonates, which, which again is one to 30 days old. Um, so for example, cardiac output in an infant is 200 mLs per kilo per minute. <laughs> That's a lot, you guys. That's more than double our cardiac output. I mean, an adult cardiac output is 70 mLs per kilo per minute. So 200 mLs per kilo per minute in an infant. That's, I mean, that's insane, right? So um, it just goes to show you why they have increased oxygen uh, requirements, right? Because they have such a high metabolic output. They just, their, their heart rate, their heart's working so hard um, to maintain that cardiac output. Um, I'm over that. Okay. Just looking at my notes, make sure I don't leave anything important out. I probably can't go through everything with you, but I'm going to try my best to start wrapping this up here soon. Um, I want to touch on that temperature regulation in kids is very important. Um, just in general, when you're under anesthesia, you don't shiver. You can't shiver, especially if you think you're paralyzing someone. Um, but the other thing too, and under anesthesia is, um, you vasodilate. So you kind of all that core temperature that you have, it just, when you vasodilate dilate like that, you kind of like lose a lot of your circulation to your periphery and it just, you lose the heat. Um, and so when kids don't have a lot of body service area, they get cold very quickly. Um, but I've also seen 
that you can cook kids quickly. <laughs> so you want to really make sure you keep an eye on their temperature. You don't want them too hot. You don't want them too cold. You want them just right. You know, like the porridge, you want, the, want it just right. <laughs> um, so just make sure you're monitoring the temperature in kids. Make sure if you have a little neonate that you're getting the French fry light, I call it a French fry light. There might be another name for it, but it's just that light that sits over top of them and you turn it on that like, you know, keeps them like little French fries, a little warm and nice and toasty. Um, having um, the bear hugger on and ready to go before the kid even gets in the room I don't know if you've ever felt it, but when you first turn the bear hugger on, it's cold. <laughs> like I wouldn't want that blowing at me. Even if it's only for like 30 seconds, I don't want cold air blowing on me for 30 seconds. So doing the bear hugger prior to them, even entering the room, getting it nice and warm for them. Um, you know, you can always say something fun to the kids. Like this is a magic carpet. You know, I, I mean, Aladdin's really not a popular kid movie anymore. Maybe it still is, but you know, just having fun with them. Like this is a magic blanket and this is a, you know, a blanket straight out of the dryer or whatever. Maybe just having fun and kind of making the thing. Oh, this is cool. I want to sit on this. Um, so having fun with the kids is important too. And I, I think that's why I do enjoy peds is no, get me wrong. It doesn't always work out this way. There's sometimes you, you just can't, they come in the room and they're like, ah, and you're like, well, here we go. I'm going to get my muscles out. I'm going to wrestle them down like an alligator and they're going to go to sleep. And it's stinks. It stinks for them. It stinks for you. But, you know, unfortunately, once they pass that point of like being that fearful, there's really no return. There's no, you, there, you can't spend a half hour in the operating room trying to convince a, ba a kid to go to sleep nicely. <laughs> so at that point, if they're not willing to play with your game and have fun with you and get to know you, you just have to crank the gas all the way up and go to sleep. And, um, I guess I should point that out too, when you're, you're going to sleep like that, um, you know, make sure you're going to hundred percent as soon as you can. So I'm not saying nitrous is wrong. Um, cause it does get the gather gas on quicker. And that's always the point of an inhalation induction. You want the quickest way possible to get through that stage too. Um, but you don't want to, you know, once they're through that, make sure you put them on hundred percent it's pretty easy to forget about that. And then you go to want to actually intubate and you realize you haven't had them on hundred percent. And that's, you have, then you have to take more time, really tank them up because then you don't want them to desaturate during induction. So make sure you're putting on hundred percent oxygen as soon as you possibly can after you get the IV and all that stuff. Um, you no longer need the nitrous. Um, but yeah, another thing too, is that I do a lot is I prime my circuit. So like, if I know the kid, um, if I get a heads up, Hey, the kid's super anxious, this is going to be a you know, we're going to go straight to the, you know, straight to sleep as soon as possible kind of <laughs> induction. I'll actually prime my circuit. Um, and that way when they do get the mask, I just, I plug it into the vent, like you're doing a vent check or like a, a machine check. So it kind of concentrate all the gas in your Ambu bag and everything. And then that way, when you're actually slamming the mask on their face, you already have ton. You're there when they take that first big inhalation, um, because they're crying and they're upset, they're going to get a ton of gas and they're going to go to sleep much quicker. Um, so that's just a tip to prime your, your tubing and everything with gas, um, for a really, really quick inhalation induction. Um, I'm actually going to take a moment here to, um, interrupt you guys and kind of let you guys know that if you're not familiar with Syrian School Prep Academy and what we have to offer, I'm just going to go a quick little information here. I promise I'll keep it short, but Syrian School Prep Academy is for anyone who has hundred percent committed to the idea of CRNA. It's for even a senior nursing student. If you're a brand new ICU nurse, um, even if you've been a nurse for 10 years and now you're deciding to go back to the ICU to pursue anesthesia, we have so much that we can offer you. We do monthly education. We also do monthly Q and A sessions. That way you can get your questions answered. I really feel like the time I spent working with students, what really hinders people the most is not having answers, not knowing what to do next, not knowing their particular situation and how to handle that, whether that be GPA grades, courses, how to get good at shadowing experience, how to, you know, boost their application what kind of ICU to work in. I mean, there's so much, there's so much, right? It's overwhelming. Um, so Syrian School Prep Academy is here to help you. And it's also a really great prep. So if you, have, even if you've gained acceptance, the fact that we do monthly education, I'm telling you right now, the education we do is in their anesthesia education. It's not that we include the anesthesia aspect of it. We leave that part out because that's for when you actually start your school, but everything else we incorporate into our pathophysiology pharmacology course. So Everything we teach you, whether it be cardiovascular, endocrine, respiratory, 
all these things you're going to be learning as students anyway. So it's a really great way to get a head start on your learning. And so, so many people, the first thing they do when they get accepted is what can I do now? What can I do to get ahead? Well, the monthly education courses we offer are exactly what I think is a solution to get ahead. Um, we also store all these recordings in our learning library. Uh, I know I'm super clever with the names, right? Um, so you can always go back and re-reference these later. We also now have CE credits available for these courses. It starts um, in June. So if, I'm trying to think when I'm, this is going to go live. So almost July. So June is our first month of actually having CE credits. And so from here on out, I'm submitting all of our workshops for CE credits. They're going to be two CE credits, a workshop. So they're about two hours long. Um, you're going to have to do a post-op, a post-op, <laughs> see? You're going to have to do a, a post-evaluation and quiz, um, but then you get your CE credits. So um, I'm hoping that this will open opportunities for employer reimbursement, things like that. But all right, that's enough of that advertisement for Serenade School Prep Academy. We'll get right back into today's um, episode. Next, we're going to go into um, a little bit, touch into some preoperative medication for kids, or maybe even some medications that you can give to help with anxiety. Um, the biggest one, obviously, is Versed. Um, oral Versed is great for kids. However, <laughs> it doesn't always work. Sometimes you're like, oh, they really need it. And then they come back to the OR, they're still flying off the wall. And you see all this liquid all over their, their chest <laughs> it's because they spit it out. So it doesn't really do a lot of good if it's on the gown. Um, and again, kids don't necessarily always have IVs. So unfortunately, that's why sometimes they come back and they're like, like amped up and you just have to wrestle them down like an alligator to go to, <laughs> go to sleep. Um, but Versed's great for kids. I even in, in kids who do okay. It's kind of a nice thing to give if you want a more smooth emergence because kids are more likely to have this emergence delirium. Um, and again, just a quick touch on emergence delirium. It's you get more emergence delirium with sevoflurane than isoflurane. So you can always, if you really are worried about it, you could switch over to isoflurane for the wake up. Like you can induce with sevo because it's a less irritable gas for the airway and then switch over to isoflurane for the wake up. Isoflurane really does leave people stunned. <laughs> it was actually my favorite gas to use in adults. Um, now, obviously, I'm pretty, I just use Sevoflurane on everyone. I rarely switch it over myself. If I'm worried about um, emergency delirium, I use Presidex. I love Presidex. It's a great drug for emergency delirium as well as Versed. Um, so, again, don't be afraid to use Versed, even if you've already gone to sleep. Sometimes it's nice for the wake up as well. So, don't forget that. Um, but touching a little bit on Presidex, um, so Presidex, um, as you guys know, um, it is, um, kind of how it works and it actually can cause some hypotension because it inhibits the release of nor or norepinephrine, um, which also is how it ha has the, um, analgesia, um, and the anxiolytic properly properties where it kind of can calm you down a little bit because norepi in itself ramps you up, you know, it's part of your, you know, fight or flight drug, you know, neurotransmitter. So when you're kind of inhibiting that release, it, it can actually cause the sedative effect that um, Prestex has. Um, and another drug that you're probably familiar using in the ICU is clonidine. Clonidine is Prestex, except not as potent. <laughs> and it's a similar drug. So again, just to kind of relate it to you guys, um, Prestex is eight times more potent um, than clonidine. Um, let's see, we went over the induction already. I could jump ahead of myself there. Um, obstruction, you know, always make sure you have your oral airway. Um, the same with adults obstruction can happen, especially when you relax someone after you have gas on board or give them pr the propofol, their tongue can fall back and really cause them to obstruct. Um, your pinky on your left hand will be the strongest finger <laughs> that you have after you practice anesthesia for a while. Um, so that you really use that pinky to do a jaw thrust. And, you know, back when I used to do a lot of the cardio versions, um, you know, especially because you need, sometimes you need two hands, one hand to chart, one hand to manage the patient. So a lot of times what I would do is obviously to have oxygen on that, you know, we would shut off for the, you know, the actual shock, but then I would just do my one finger, you know, jaw, like just put your one finger there, do a jaw thrust. And that's all you usually need is just one sided jaw thrust. Um, but again, when you're masking, you want to use that one pinky to just get their jaw up and kind of, you know, lift a little bit. Um, so don't forget to use your pinky kids. I'll tell you right now, unless they're a bigger kid, you don't really have to do a whole lot of jaw thrusting unless, and like, don't get me wrong. If they're a teenager or a big kid, yes, you know, you can, but most kids for the most part are much easier to mask ventilate. Again, that's my own personal opinion and experience. Um, they can be hard when they're really hard. They're really hard. But again, I struggle a lot more with adults because you have the facial hair and like, 
you know, no cheeks because they're all sunken in like this, you know, so you're like trying to scrape some fat over into the mask, you know, or kids, you know, they're usually nice and plump still. They still have all that nice collagen in their cheeks to kind of plump them up for you. Um, all right, so let's quickly touch on endotracheal tubes. And I think that might sum up things here. Um, I want to go over with you guys the formula for that. Uh, the formula for choosing your size of endotracheal tube is age divided by four plus four. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think. So if you had a two-year-old divided by four, that's a half, right? And then plus four, four and a half for a two-year-old. And is that right? Yeah, it seems awfully big. So I would actually probably use a four. <laughs> so, and again, this is all um, a rough estimate. So yeah, four and a half for a two-year-old, but like use your best judgment. If they're a smaller two-year-old and like I said, I always have two sizes out, you know, you could have a four and a half and a four and, you know, I always try to go with the smaller tube that I can still easily ventilate the kid with versus trying to cram a big tube in there. It's typically easier to get a smaller tube in anyways, but you obviously don't want to have so small that you have a giant leak that you can't inflate your cuff and you still have a leak, or now you have high airway pressures because you're ventilating through such a small tube and they need more ventilation. So you have to be wise, but you know, again, um, use your best judgment. There could be a big two-year-old and a little two-year-old. There could be a big four-year-old and a little four-year-old. So having generalizations for sizes. And to be quite honest with you guys, unless I'm really not sure, I rarely do these formulas anymore. Like I just know based on age, uh, typically about what they need. Um, and again, I always have two sizes out anyways. And so when they roll in the room, if I hadn't seen them yet, at that point, I can make my, my decision um, or even talk to the surgeon. Sometimes, again, if you have a kid with a history of tracheal stenosis, make sure you're looking back through their chart to see what they used last time. That's another thing too, is even if they don't have tracheal stenosis, if they have old records, look at them. Why not? But the thing with kids, sometimes it could be like two years ago, three years ago. And you know, you grow as a kid, you know, we're adults it's like, Oh, cool. They used a, a Mac three, eight Oh tube grade one view that didn't change from like four years ago. But as a kid, four years is a lot of time you grow and develop a lot in four years. So, you know, you're not going to be able to use the same thing they did, but at least it's nice to know if they had an easy airway. Um, so always try to make sure you're looking back in your chart. Um, so that's that formula. Um, so the length, the length, as far as how deep to put it, um, is typically your age divided by two plus 12. Um, and that is pretty accurate. Um, now, but again, you have to always make sure you're listening for bilateral breast sounds because, you know, everyone's different. You know, these are, these are just like the weight based calculation to figure out someone's weight you're going to have variations in normal. So you always want to make sure you're taking that extra moment to listen to bilateral breast sounds. Um, you know, atelectasis can really hurt someone. You don't want someone to go a whole case and only ventilate one lung. And I will say in adults, um, I haven't seen it too much in kids, but I also don't know if I've, I haven't done a lot of one lung ventilation in kids. In adults, I did one lung ventilation a lot in my lungs. Um, and I will say when you write main stem someone, you typically know not only because your peak pressures are high, if you're on like a volume, you know, mode on the ventilator, but because you'll desat, like you don't typically stay at hundred percent oxygen level with a one lung ventilation and maybe not desat down to like 80, but you'll might desat down to like 92, 93. And you're like, that's weird. And it could be because you're right main stem. So something to keep in mind, um, to always consider if you're not, if you can't figure out why you're not hundred percent, if you're on hundred percent oxygen, you're only satting 94% consider that you might be right main stemmed, um, and watch for chest excursion and listen for bilateral breath, breath sounds. Um, all right. So another thing I want to touch on is the Mac, um, and kids is the highest at six months old. That's pretty young. So I think a lot of times, and at least I know me, I'm speaking for me too, you guys, is that sometimes I think, oh, kids, they need more gas, <laughs> you know, just gotta slam on the gas. It's really not true. Um, as they get older, I mean, yes, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, little kids do need more, but like just a little bit, not a lot. Um, and it's the high, your Mac is the highest at six months old. So again, that's pretty young. Um, so that you need a higher Mac at six months, but by the time you get to be like three, four, I mean, I tell you right now we do these tonsils and they're, they're quick, you know, and if you have a lot of gas on in that case, you will burn yourself because they're going to be done. You're gonna be trying to wake them up longer than the case actually took to do. Um, so you get them deep for the induction and you pretty much turn the gas at just a half a Mac and let them ride. And then as soon as they get the first tonsil out, gas is off and maybe some nit nit nitrous to kind of keep them deeper while they're finishing up, especially if they're having bleeding. Sometimes it's going back and forth between keeping them back up, <laughs> lighting them back up. Um, cause if they're bleeding, they're, you know, not, they're not drying up nicely. So long story short, 
um, you know, kids don't, kids don't really need a lot of gas. Like I think the way I used to always think, oh, they just need a lot more to stay asleep. Um, it's just really doesn't prove to be true in the clinical realm, even though you're going to read it in textbooks and typically, yes, the Mac is the highest at six months, just so you know, from my own clinical experience, it's really not that much different. Now, a teenager compared to an 80 year old, heck yeah, a lot different. I'm not saying that at all, but you know, a teenager to a 20 some year old, really not much different, you know, a 30 year old, still not much different. Okay. A 70, 80 year old. Yes. Very different. <laughs> you know, as I said, you get to be over 30 and you start to decline, <laughs> you have less brain cells. So you don't, you need as much to get scrambled. <laughs> um, and it's especially true in the elderly population, like in the 90 some years old, 80 year old, like you really don't need a lot of gas. Like you're going to way overdo it. Like half Mac is plenty for them. Um, and you'll deal with a lot of hypotension if you slam an old person with gas. Um, so don't, don't, don't do that either. Um, all right. Well, I think that might sum up everything. I'm going to go through my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything that I really want to go over. Yeah, I think that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, pediatrics is fun. It can also be scary, <laughs> um, but it's also very rewarding, very enjoyable. Um, kids are awesome. Kids are fun. So I encourage you to go into your peds rotation, even if you don't want to do peds, go into it with like just positivity and good expectations and kind of embrace the uncomfortableness. Cause know that you're not alone. If you're scared, if you're terrified, that's a good thing. That's, that's to be expected. And even after seven years of practicing, you guys, I'm still nervous to go into work, especially like I'm going to be home now for 12 weeks on maternity leave. I'm going to be nervous going back on my first day. I'm going to don't you, you think I just know everything like this? No, I'm gonna have to brush up on my weight based dosing again. I'm going to have to re recall how to give drugs. I always do that. Um, it does become second nature once you do it enough. And it's, it would take me two seconds to refresh myself, but I don't really want to think about like how to dose rock right now or Presidex or Atricurium or, I mean, psh, ah, I'll worry about, like, I'll look at, I mean, if I look it up and then it will come back to you, you're like, oh yeah, that's how you dose it. Um, so just know that everyone kind of has a learning curve. And if you haven't experienced it yet, just embrace it. Um, and that everyone's been there. Everyone's there. No one just automatically knows the stuff. Um, you know, maybe if you were a PICU nurse and you've been exposed to this before, but otherwise everyone's going to start off where you're starting off, which is not knowing. Um, so just embrace it, have fun with it, enjoy and, um, and learn. So I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget to, um, I don't know, leave me a review. I'm trying to think of like my word of my thoughts here, but yeah, leave me a review. I love to hear from you guys. Um, send me an email at Jenny Fennell at Syrian school prep Academy. Um, if you have any questions, we will have my email and contact down below in the show notes. Make sure you follow me. If you're on YouTube, submit, subscribe to the podcast. I hope to hear and hope you, uh, we can chat every week and you guys have a good rest of your day and have a happy 4th of July. All right. Bye-bye.